if you only had one clip from this entire podcast, maybe to uh, put in front of a homeowner, it's understanding what the stress cycle looks like for trees. By the time I get a phone call that a post oak looks bad and it's got borers, you know, beetles in it, mm -hmm. it's way too late. The question you got to ask is how did that tree get there? Very likely it started because, you know, the past 10 years has been a really hard time to be a tree in these parts. And droughts and freezes and major, major rain events. Let's say a drought happens and maybe you're not watering your yard enough or a drought happens and then you overwater, right? So a tree gets stressed on from the drought. Then you overwater for a long period of time and the roots get stressed. They can't get oxygen. That starts a cycle where the tree starts declining a bit. You know, it's really amazing that trees have made it this long uh, in the world without us. It's amazing that they've evolved as far as they have without, you know, our help. <laughs> hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Your Project Shepherd podcast. I am your host, Curtis Lawson, and today we are going to get into a very shady topic. It's all about trees. Unfortunately, uh, I've seen trees really kind of be a complete afterthought by a lot of builders and uh, developers and, and homeowners, um, and whether that means protecting the trees that they have or thinking about what they're going to plant, what they're going to do like long term on the property after the house gets built. And so uh, for some reason, that always seems like an afterthought. Um, and, and often people, I think, do kind of the bare minimum and they just go with whatever the city or the local government wants them to do or makes them do. Um, and so I've been wanting to do an episode for a while now to talk about the, the whys and the hows of tree care, tree selection. Um, and so joining me today on the podcast uh, is my friend Chad Hesters. And uh, I met Chad through, I think, through Toner Kirsting, who's one of my regular guests, almost like a co-host here. Uh, Toner uh, does some work with Chad uh, on some expert witness stuff and various things that they're both involved in. So, um, but Chad is a board certified master arborist. Uh, he has a degree in forestry from Texas A&M, and he's one of the few folks out there in the area qualified to conduct things like risk assessments and evaluate tree diseases like oak wilt. Um, oh, and I almost for, forgot to mention his company name. He is the owner of Paloma Tree Consultants. So, Chad, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Did I get all that right? Yes, that's exactly right. My, well, wife, my wife just essentially says I'm an epic tree nerd, and she's <laughs> probably not wrong. So tell us about, uh, you know, Paloma Tree Consultants, what you guys do, and, and how you got into doing this. Paloma Tree Consultants and is really just me, and... And uh, I am a, I'm a consulting arborist, which means I don't own a tree care company in the sense of, you know, we don't, uh, we don't do tree trimming, tree pruning. Uh, we try to serve the place in the market between homeowners, uh, business people, developers, construction companies that need, they've got a problem statement they're trying to solve for around their trees. They need information. They need options. They want to get smarter and they need, they need non-conflicted help to try to make that determination. A lot of a lot of my practice is based in really sound science, education and sort of best practices uh, across that that spectrum, but then applying it in the art that is in your industry, you know, there's a set of plans that look great, but actually making it happen takes a little bit of art sometimes. And so I I sit between that and that conflict of interest is one that my clients I think is probably one of the main reasons people use a consulting arborist is they know that we're not taking kickbacks or referral fees or anything like that from uh, from any kind of service we might use or recommend and we're trying to give the best most honest opinion we can on a, on a situation yeah so you're not making a few extra bucks if the tree gets removed right like you're not you're not getting kickback from the right from the tree removal company or you're not removing it yourself and making a profit on that right right and you know, people just seem to, they tend to trust the circumstances a little bit more. If I'm standing there and say, hey, I think this tree's got to come out. If, you know, it's different if your guys are behind you sharpening their saws and they're like, <laughs> I don't know, does it really? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's, um, you know, uh, that's really the the value proposition is like any consultants and stuff that you do and, and toner, as you mentioned, is helping people get the information they need to make good, high quality decisions. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the reasons I, I love consulting. It, it, it feels good to be able to, to give somebody 
an expert opinion on something. And now what they do with that information right. is, is, t- <laughs> is totally up to them, but it feels good to be able to talk to somebody about it. Some, whether, you know, for you trees or for me consulting with people on you know, how their project's going, the best way to go about that project, um, without them feeling like I have an, ul- an ulterior, ulterior motive to get them to buy something else from me. Right. You know, I, I love the I love the the consulting world, but it is frustrating though, and I'm sure that you experience this too when you you give somebody that good advice and then you watch them do the exact opposite or just kind of half-ass listen to you. Man, we could probably swap stories for a real long time on that topic, but yeah. But people, you know, when I say, hey, it's your tree, it's your house, right? Right. I mean, and you're going to do what, what you want to with it. My job is to try to, you know, like I said, to get you the options and you can choose your option and I'm, yeah. I'll, I can make my best attempt to tell you the implications of those options. Yep. <laughs> but you know, the, the great, the great example is, and you see this in the development world a lot, uh, and you see it particularly in the urban and suburban environments where, you know, somebody's doing a remodel or they're doing a new home build and they've got some great, you know, grandmother oak tree in their front yard. And they're like, Oh man, we really going to, we're going to build around that, that tree. <laughs> right. Or, or we're going to put a pool right next to it. Right. And you're like, okay, but you know, if you do that, you're going to end up removing, you know, 50% of the tree's root system. The tree's probably dead in two years or so. And they're like, yeah, but it's sure going to look good. And you're like, best of luck. <laughs> I saw this picture on Instagram of, of, of a house built around a tree, you know, and that's what I want. Right. It's so cool to have the tree growing up out of the house. Yeah. And, you know, some of that's the architect's fault uh, if, they're, if it's an architect-driven project, but some of it's not. I know a lot of really high quality architects and home construction firms that will tell the client specifically, like, this is a bad idea. And the clients, nope, we're doing it. And you're like, all right. Yeah. So it's uh, my only recommendation to anybody in your, in your audience here that might be an architect or in, uh, you know, run a construction company or something is get it, get it on paper. Yep. You know, tell your client about the risk that's inherent in that. Get some good advice. You know, obviously, I'm recommending using a consulting arborist to give a report. And I'm sure we can get into that later in the conversation about development. But, you know, you want to detail the risk of messing with trees during construction to clients. And then, unfortunately, in today's litigious environment, you got to kind of cover your rear end mm-hmm. a little bit on that. Yeah. And, and think about you know, what are the long-term implications to the, to the structure? You know, if the, if the tree lives and grows and the root, the roots uh, get into the foundation, or if that tree dies and suddenly, and we've talked about this before on some found, some foundation topics, if that tree dr- dies, the, the amount of water that tree is drinking every day is tremendous in that, if that tree dies, all of a sudden, all that excess water is now staying in the soil. That's right. And your house is going to move. So right. there's a lot of considerations to. Well, and the opposite is true. You plant that that live oak tree right next to your house that you just built, and it grows like trees do. It's pulling water out of the soil. Right. So you could have the opposite problem too over a 10, 20 year period, you know, time. And yeah, the. In in tree world, the the phrase that solves most problems is the right tree in the right place, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Most of most of tree problems we see in the urban and, and suburban environments are going to be like somebody just thought it was a great idea to put four live oak trees six inches from their house, you know, and uh, and there's just no way you're going to solve that. Yep. All right. So, um, like I said in the intro, I, I feel like oftentimes trees kind of get pushed to the back burner um, when people are planning projects. And we've done a couple of episodes about landscaping in the past, and it's it's kind of the same thing. I think often people don't think about the trees you know, as part of the landscaping, but trees specifically, people don't think about it until the very end, and uh, or maybe the end of the planning process, even the design process that you know, usually. You know, you start by designing the house, and then the landscaping gets designed, and and maybe the trees are even at the tail end of of that thought. Uh, and so, oftentimes, the budget is kind of gone by then. They're like, "Man, we've already spent a million and a half on building this house. Now, you know, the thought of spending another hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars on landscaping, it's like, ouch! And so now we got to find places to cut back. Um, and so, I I know that people, I feel like people know the value of trees and their property. I mean, it's something that we hear all the time when you're talking to 
your realtor or you know you're driving through the neighborhood like you can see the value of the trees and you you hear about the value of trees so it's not like it's a a place of ignorance people aren't ignorant of the value um so so what you know why do you think that kind of tree uh you know uh, kind of tree planning whether it's keeping existing or planting new why do you think that's kind of almost kind of like a, a back burner thing for people it's interesting the the incentives around sort of the tree thing i think people think that trees are a lot more hardy than they than they really are uh because you can do something in and around a tree and it can take years to manifest because you don't unless you're like doing something catastrophic to it like you know cutting it down or running a truck into it or it's a hurricane a lot of times you don't see the implications of it and so people think oh the trees are pretty pretty hardy uh and will they don't require the care they actually do but your point about uh the value of trees i mean there's a lot of empirical and anecdotal evidence around property values with trees um it's the reason that if you search the internet probably and type in, I haven't done this, but I'm assuming if you were to type in like, you know, idyllic suburban street, right? It's probably gonna pop up one with a big leafy trees everywhere. Mm -hmm. and because in our minds, that's kind of what we think about, at least in our culture here, you know, we kind of think about like, oh, that that's a great place to live. Mm -hmm. And it's because trees, you know, if you think about Houston in particular, like this is a major, major, you know, there's a major heat environment when it comes to like the reflective nature of all the concrete. Mm -hmm. Trees in a neighborhood can lower your average daily temperatures from anywhere from five to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Like that's scientifically proven. Mm -hmm. They filter particulates out of the air. They control erosion. They are excellent for water management in a you know city like Houston where we get a lot of water and flooding. Uh, you know, trees have a lot of benefits in the urban ecosystem. And I think people inherently know that they might be able, not be able to articulate it, mm -hmm. but they know it, it, it. They they know that the world is better with trees in it, and why they wait to the last minute. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the stuff I do is forensic in nature. Yeah. <laughs> it's like what went my, wrong? My tree's dead, and I'll go and take this. Um, you know, I've got like a soil uh, uh, plug puller, right? And I'll put it in the ground, pull it out, pull 18 inches of uh, soil cap out of there, and you'll see turf grass where they put the turf in, eight inches or 10 inches of fill, you know, that orange filter, the stabilized stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see the original soil and and the tree's roots are all compacted and and and, it, and they didn't think about it during, during construction. So as much as it sounds like a plug, it's really not. Like you got to get a qualified arborist in early with the architect when the plant, during the planning phase, as you mentioned, you know, and evaluate what it is they want to do, evaluate the trees on the property, which ones are healthy and should even stay, mm -hmm. right? And then, so now you're limiting, by doing that, you limit the trees you've got, you know what you've got, you know what you can work with. And if you tell the arborist, this is what we're trying to do here, then that can also feed into can, you know, protection during construction, care, maintenance plans. Yeah, but it's it should be done early. Yeah. So one of the kind of the first topics I wanted to touch on is is the, the protection and the preservation. In, in a, a lot of uh, cities have tree protection requirements. Mm -hmm. Now, whether they're enforced or not is another story. I think Houston, uh, I got to be honest with you, and I build a lot of houses in Houston. I don't even know if, you, if the city of Houston requires it. I know they don't enforce it. Um, now, certain neighborhoods do, right. like uh, we're, we're building a house in um, uh, Tanglewood, and Tanglewood HOA has has real strict rules about that. Um, some of the smaller cities within Houston, like West U, Bel Air, Memorial Villages, they require cheap protection. They require a, a, a report from an arborist as well. Um, but again, the biggest municipality that I deal with, which is which is the city of Houston, kind of turns a blind eye unless it's like on a historic street and there's a bunch of giant old oak trees on a street, then they might care. Right. Right. But, um, I think because you're dealing with a, a big city who doesn't really enforce any of that or, do, or doesn't seem to care, um, a lot of builders kind of have this attitude of let's do the bare minimum. And it's, you know, it's, it's like a lot of other things with, with, with many builders and developers. It's like, let's, let's do the bare, let's build, let's build to the code minimum. Let's do the, the, the least that we have to do to get by. But when it comes to 
to tree protection, when, when people are forced to do it, I think they just do the bare minimum that's required. So whatever, you know, if, if the city of Bel Air says you got to put up a chain link fence so high within a certain perimeter, let's just go buy the cheapest thing we can get up to meet the bare minimum requirement and not really worry about the other steps that are kind of required. So just putting up a little fence around the tree is, is kind of might meet the spirit of the code, but really it doesn't offer that much protection. There's, there's more steps right. that are required to properly protect that tree. And so let's, let's, let's kind of talk about, you know, you know, what are the steps to properly protect the tree beyond just putting up a little chain link or fence or a wood picket fence around the tree during construction? Yeah. And that, that fence you're talking about is in the, you know, in the industry, it's called the tree protection zone. Right. And where that fence goes, the f- well, the fact that you're even putting up a fence is very helpful, right? Because um, the it, probably in order of impact to trees on construction sites, the 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 biggest impact is going to be um, compacted soils, mm-hmm. right? I mean, tree roots they need oxygen, they need to get water, uh, and if you have compacted soils, and you know, in our soils around here, you drive skid steers over them long enough. Uh, they're going to, they're, they turn into concrete, mm-hmm. right? And, and that's the kind of thing I was mentioning earlier about how they tend to take a while for the tree. You see the impact, mm-hmm. um, but it can, there are steps you can do to, to mitigate it. But, uh, the best time to do it, as you mentioned, is, you know, during, before it happens, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, now the thing about, about protection of trees during construction is, and you, and you alluded to it earlier, you have to ask the question early on. Is this, does this, should this tree even be here? Like, are we trying to round peg square hole this? Yeah. Right. Are we, is, uh, is the tree going to be able to survive in this environment? What's the, what's happening with the soils? What's happened to space constraints around the tree? You know, height, width, what's the yard going to look like? If the landscape plan is to come in and put up, you know, big tree beds around a, you know, I'll give you an example, water oaks, We've got a lot of water oaks around here. Mm-hmm. Those things have probably anywhere between a 40 and a 60 year lifespan. If you got a 50-year-old water oak in your yard, and it's art, it's kind of on the back end of the decline curve, and then you're gonna, the plan is to come in and build uh, a uh, flower bed around it and scrape off the the St. Augustine grass and put in zoysia on top of it and water the heck out of it all, every day for the rest of your life. Like that tree is not gonna survive. Yeah. So the first step in tree protection is just even asking the question like. Man, should this tree even be here? Yep. Okay. If the answer is yes, then that tree protection zone is probably the most important thing you can do. And uh, the way to think about it is uh, as you get, so, you know, think about tree canopy, right? The drip line of a tree is the extension of the tree canopy. As you get from the edge of the drip line going into the, towards the trunk of the tree, it's a logarithmic scale on the amount of damage that happens as you work your way in. It's mm. not a linear scale. So if you're going to put in an irrigation system and you need and you're at the drip line of a tree, probably okay. The tree will probably survive. Might want to do some root pruning as you're doing it. You put that irrigation system four feet from the tree and cut 50% of the root system, right? Might as well not have the tree. Uh, the, the width of that tree protection zone is very important. And I would say it's the most important thing a builder, developer, homeowner could do to protect the tree. Outside of that, then you think about root damage from utilities, irrigation systems. Uh, and then I would say finally the third thing that happens during construction that is a big impact is it's usually in the absence of a tree protection zone. But people, contractors, subs are dumping out. Con- clean out concrete buckets, you know, next to the tree or they're storing materials or they're parking under it. And all these things have a cumulative effect. So the tree protection is the most important thing you can do. And then preventing access, you know, yeah. un- underneath that, that drip line to the extent possible. The caveat I'll give you is I've never seen a development project when we had a perfect circle tree protection zone right around the tree, right next to the house. Right. Right? There's always a compromise. Yeah. A lot of the lots just aren't big enough. I mean, like uh, the one, one that we're, we're building right now in Bel Air, it's a corner lot and there's only you know two ways that we can get in to access the, the house. So there's sidewalks there. You got two streets and it's only a 
6,000 square foot lot to begin with. And we've got, I think, four big trees to protect. Yeah. You know, and the city code said you're supposed to take the whole drip, drip line of the tree and put the fence up. If we did that, there's nowhere to build the house. Right. And so we had to compromise and go as far as we could to still provide access to get to the site, to, you know, to build the house. And so it's, it's probably half of the drip line instead of all the whole drip line, but it, yeah, you're doing what you can. It's what we could do. Right. Yeah. And that's the, when I was mentioning the kind of the art of the, the art of the practice, if you will, uh, most of the time when, when a, con, when a, uh, I mean, present company excluded, but when a builder hears the, uh, the homeowner wants to bring in an arborist, a lot of times they're like, Oh man. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause they know life, life's about to get harder. Or they're going to make life you know difficult or whatnot, or put it in a tree zone and the subs are going to complain because there's no place to eat lunch, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and I, I feel like I spend a lot of time, uh, being the guy between the homeowner, the builder, the subs, the architect, and, and trying to, um, this is probably an, uh, uh this is an old dated reference, but did you ever see the movie Animal House? Oh, yeah. Do you remember that scene at the end of it where Kevin Bacon's standing in the middle of the... He's in his RTC uniform, and he's standing in the middle of the intersection, and there's like a riot and and mass hysteria around him, and he says, remain calm, all is well, <laughs> right? I feel like I'm Kevin Bacon a lot of times because you got these very, sometimes very uninformed, but disparate viewpoints. Yeah. And the value of a consulting arborist that has seen the movie before, uh, not just Animal House, but the, the tree movie, right, <laughs> is um, is that they can sit there and be the compromise and hear everybody and come up with a plan that brings people together. You know, the worst arborist you could have come out is, you know, the tree hugger, uh, all, trees are, all trees are good no matter what, mm -hmm. and there's no such thing as a compromise. Like, it's not helpful. Yeah. So... I think, I think, you know, much like in your advisory business, your job is to try to understand what people are trying to do and do the best thing for the tree. And that's in those circumstances, but it's never going to be hundred percent perfect. Yeah. So introducing an arborist into the equation, I, I think it, it, people tend to see that it complicates or think that it complicates things. And I think also people see that as maybe just another added expense on the project. But you know, most most builders, I'll say most, want you know they want to do things the right way, and most clients want to do things the right way. So I think sometimes it's it's just coming from a place of, of ignorance of not knowing that this is what we need to do. But um, this is one of the reasons that you know, building something the right way and using a good builder with a good team costs more. You know, it's, it's, it's also the, you know, the reason that, you know, when, you know, I give somebody a proposal for construction as a builder, you know, my cost for the project is you know, way higher than the, the other guy they're talking to is the cheap guy, because I'm, I'm already working with all these other team members right. who, who add some incremental cost. Um, and is it, is it required? Do I have to do it? No. But do I do I want to do it that way because it's the right thing to do, the right thing for the client, the right thing for the for the project, the right thing for all the components of the project, like the trees? Yeah, and so that's the reason that we cost more than other people, and I, I think that's something that uh, doesn't always get taken into account when people are looking at their project budget. Again, landscaping trees are often kind of at the tail end of the budget conversation. And so when, 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 it, when those topics come up, they're like, man, we just got to save some money here and not even mess with that. Right. So, uh, because they had the $50,000 change order for appliances it's somewhere, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and you get to the end of the project and there's not a lot of money. I, you know, maybe the best way to handle that is it's all about expectations. I hold the view that it's like that with any relationship, whether it's your spouse, your kids or your friends or work colleagues or clients, like setting expectations, understand what people care about. And so up front, asking the question, hey, what do you care about? Like, is this, how important are these trees to this project? Is it, you know, there are people, I, I was on a, on a project a while ago where there's this big marquee oak tree um, and they were trying to do a remodel on this family home that's been in the family five or six generations. And like the great grandmother planted this oak tree. And so it had a lot of sentimental value. And it wasn't until we were on site walking around and, and you know, I asked the, the homeowner, I was like, Hey, tell me about your trees. 
and and it led to them telling me the entire family's history, mm. which happens a lot with me. I hear a lot about people's life stories uh, when it comes to their trees or what's happening in their lives right now because it's a, they're really connected to them. That's a really good signal that people care about a tree. And so you you know, note to self as you're putting in your bid, you're like, hey, we heard you. And that'd be a mm. piece of advice that I'd have for, especially for building contractors, probably more the custom home situation because your spec homes, you know, they're not really getting into that. But when a client tells you the trees matter, write it down. And then it almost gives you permission to put it in your, in your spec. It's like, hey, here's a thousand bucks for... Uh, you know, for us to have a sort you know, uh, consulting arborist come out on the front end, back end, and then help us with, with post construction, mm -hmm. you know, a thousand bucks on a, you know, million dollar remodel, rounding error. Yeah. And if you tell them about that up front, it, it sends a signal that you're listening. Yeah. You care about this, the little things, which I don't think it's a little thing, but to your point, it, yeah. uh, and so, uh, it's a way as a, as if you're a, you're working at the high end of the market. I think it's also a way you can differentiate yourself between every other home builder out there. Yeah. So, so when when you're going over your final budget for the project and they ask you, "Hey, why do you have X thousand of dollars in there for that?" and and you say, "Well, you know, you told me during our first walkthrough that that you used to swing in that tree as a kid and that your grandfather planted it. So I put this extra money in here because of that." Right. They're like, "Wow, he actually heard what I said, you know, 3 months ago when we started this process." Yeah, right? and they may strike it. They may go, "I oh, don't worry about it." The They're like, oh, well, you know, I, I talked to somebody that tree is almost dead anyway." Okay, well, that's cool, but at least they know that you yeah. that you heard them and and that you care about that component of their of their their memory, their life. Yeah, and I would I mean, this question for you, I don't I don't know you're interviewing me, but <laughs> the question for you is, I mean, when you're doing custom home builds, I mean, what percentage of those client value being heard? I mean, that I would imagine it's pretty high. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, that's I, how you win the job. I would hope all of them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the, one of the things, in, in fact, I, I was kind of plugging this into my computer, my, my mental computer here. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do when we start a project with somebody is we give them a questionnaire uh, that talks about, you know, their family, how they're going to use the property, what things are important to them, what what activities do they like to do, and, and I'm sitting here thinking I, I need to add a, a question on my on my questionnaire that asks them about, you know, landscaping trees. Are there any special things that we need to preserve tree wise and yeah. you know, things like that? But yeah, I mean, it, we we ask those questions up front because we want to understand what's important to people, know what drives their decision making, and um, so that that's kind of one of our our ways of listening to them. Yeah. Any, any more questions for me? Yeah, I'll, I got some. I'll bring them later. <laughs> um, so, h how do we kind of getting back on track here? How do we decide whether or not we're going to keep a tree? So, uh, you know, we we mentioned that. Um, you know, some, some trees, you know, are or aren't worth keeping, uh, whether it's, um, the age of the tree, the health, uh, whether it's interfering with the building, but what are some other considerations that go into deciding whether or not that, that, that should stay or go? Yeah. If it's an existing tree, it's already on the property. Uh, you really got to take into consideration sort of spatial constraints, right? Height and width, like what's going to be going on in that tree. As I mentioned, you know, in the, in the tree protection zone, like what's going to be happening underground. I mean, this, this is, I don't know if this is very scientific, but I believe it to be true. I think about 80% of tree problems happen below ground. And, and so you, you got to ask the question, like what's happening to the soil around it? Uh, are we putting sod in? I mean, you know, golf courses, and trees need really different care. In fact, the way you take care of grass is almost completely inverted the way you're supposed to take care of a tree. Mm. Because, you know, grass needs frequent, shallow watering, mm -hmm. right? Trees need infrequent, deep watering. Mm. And that conflict is sort of the problem we find in the, in the urban environment or urban and suburban environment. So the question around what are some of the things you think about with, you know, regarding the tree is, well, how's the space going to be used? What's a landscape plan? Is the building going to be, you know, if it if the building's right next to the tree right now, and it's a young tree, well, in five years, 10 years, you're just asking for a massive conflict, right? So you got to think about the, not just the current state, but what does the future state look like? Um, 
And you also got to take the time to ask the question about what's the condition of the tree is if the tree's likely to be declining in the next five years, is it better to take it out and replant now? Yeah. You know, so how you use the space and the condition of the tree, not just now, but in the future, are really the, probably the primary things that you really got to consider. How do you deal with, uh, with cities, uh, cities, counties, municipalities in general, uh, that have, you know, a, a lot of restrictions on what you can remove. I mean, I, some, some cities are very, um, you know, they're easy to deal with. They, they have somebody on staff that understands kind of the give and take. Uh, but then I've also seen some cities who are just insane. It, yeah. it, cities are HOAs that are just insane. Uh, and, and they want you to keep something that's, it's not worth keeping, but it's in their, it's in their right of way. And, uh, it's, it's one of their protected trees and you got to do it. Right. So, yeah. I mean, how, how do you, how do you deal with those situations where you've got a, maybe a city arborist or maybe there's not even an arborist on staff, but just the city planning, like the maintenance crew, the, you know, that has to, <laughs> you know, the, the planning department, right. so like, Nope, you got to keep those trees. Yeah. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah. I, I think the first thing to do is you want to strike a tone that's as non-combative as possible. Right? I mean, if you think about, like, put yourself in the, in their shoes, like the, the city of Houston, you know, uh, arborist, I mean, how many, how, how big is a pile on their desk, right? Or actually maybe Houston's not a good example because they don't really have as, as developed tree ordinances and stuff, but like a place like Austin, mm -hmm. I, I mean, they can make life difficult on you. So I've been told, right? That person's got a huge stack on their desk. So the first thing to do is you got to think path of least resistance. As a homeowner, you screaming at the city and tell them how bad you don't like their policy, whatnot, like, what, like get in line, right? But if you can have somebody like a consulting arborist that knows the language, knows how to approach it from safety, health and health of the, the environment around it, you know, safety, I mean, human safety, um, the damage to the home, potential failure rates into the, into the city streets, those kinds of things that happen with trees, get to health a tree and do it in a very objective way. My experience has been is that most of your... HOAs, even with sort of very aggressive, you know, restrictions, they'll listen to it. Mm -hmm. What they don't want, what, remember what they're trying to prevent is the person taking down the 200 year old live oak tree to put in the second game room addition. Mm -hmm. That's what they're trying to prevent. They're not trying to prevent a tree that's sick or has a limb that's sticking over the house. It's got a crack in it from being removed. Right. But you got to be smart about it. You got to be professional about it and you got to make go path of least resistance is my recommend. And, and once you do that, I've had a pretty good hit rate. Once you sit down and explain it to them, you got a good piece of paper, especially if it's from a credentialed a reports from a credentialed non-conflicted, you know, advisor. Yeah. Uh, they, they tend to listen pretty well. You just might have to wait a while because their backlogs. There are some some pretty crazy uh, restrictions in some of the cities, especially in the Hill Country. Uh, I have some family that was building a house in uh, kind of a, a city inside of Austin called Sunset Valley. I don't know if you've ever dealt if, if you've dealt with them or not, but it's a small a small municipality, kind of like Bel Air, West U is inside of Houston. But uh, man, their their restrictions were insane, um, and like e every tree in the world is on, is on their protected list. Right. Uh, and so for them, I, I, it added a couple months worth of planning and back and forth with the city trying to negotiate on what could and couldn't be done during construction. Yeah. There, unfortunately, there's this idea that, you know, all trees are good and, and that's not necessarily the case. I mean, we've got a lot of invasive species that have shown up around here. Um, I'm the former uh, board president at the Houston Arboretum, and uh, we went through a major uh, effort a few years back to uh, try to restore the landscape. Uh, and I would encourage any of your visitors in this area or any of your listeners in the area to be visitors at the Arboretum, go check it out. But the amount of invasive species that have shown up in Houston over the years is incredible. And a lot of those things are not safe trees to have around. They're messy trees. Like the and Chinese towel trees and hackberries. You just and named all that probably kind of culprit number one, right? Yeah. Uh, and 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 I think trying to explain to an HOA that like, hey, not all trees are good. We should take out this, you know, f this declining Chinese tallow in this person's yard and replant. Uh, here's the reasons why. That's a conversation that 
needs to have a lot of people diff- can differentiate. They just see green and they're like, okay, green is good and green has to stay, mm-hmm. you know, which is not the case. Yeah. So on on the on the back side of the, of that uh, on the the cities requiring that you protect things they also often have a list or a requirement of what you of what you have to install install plant after the uh, the house is done right to get your final inspection and most cities have a, a list of trees here's our approved our approved tree list i've seen a lot of people just kind of look, look at that list and say okay what's the cheapest tree on the list right. <laughs> okay i can get a you know whatever uh, tree that's three inch caliper let's go buy that at home depot and right. put it in the ground right uh, but you know what 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 considerations should there be for you have this list. What what considerations are there for like okay, which ones should we plant here? Yeah. Um, you know, and what are and what are the reasons? You know, again, to avoid planting certain trees. Yeah, if I I think for the people that care, and you're right, there's the my HOA says I have to have two trees in the yard. I'm gonna go pick the ones that are on sale that have been in the pot way too long. <laughs> They'll be dead in three months. You know, uh, we'll drop them in. Uh, but for the people who really care about it. I think you really got to understand what the tree is. The first question to ask is, what's the right tree for the right place? All right, how much space do I have? Um, does this tree tolerate sunlight? Does this tree tolerate shade? Does Is it a low-lying spot uh, that's going to have a lot of water? What's the drainage around it? What's yeah. drainage around it? I mean, there's some trees that, on those on those lists you referenced that do really, really well with wet soils. And there's a whole bunch of trees that hate having their feet wet over yeah. long periods of time. And what, and what kind of soil is it, right? Is what it kind of heavy soil, clays? Is it more sandy? pH levels right. matter a lot, you know, and, and so I know it sounds like a lot, and I'm not trying to overwhelm people with the answer, but the answer to the question of which tree from the list, and, and actually those lists tend to be pretty good. They tend to be native species that are, have been established for a long time. We know how they act in the in the environment. Mm-hmm. We know the requirements. So a lot of times the problem is not the list. The problem is the point you bring up, which is wrong tree, wrong place. So taking the time, there is a there's a really uh, I think it's kind of fun. Uh, but then again, I'm a tree guy. There's a website run by the Texas Forest Service called the Texas Tree Selector. I think it's Texas Tree Selector dot com or org. They've got a couple different ways you can do this, but you can go in as a homeowner. It doesn't require a lot of extra ex- expertise and start entering the requirements in the, for the space you're looking at to plant a tree. And it'll provide you a list that at least gets you kind of 80% of the way there. It's a really great tool. I recommend builders, homeowner, take a look at it if you're, con- if you're contemplating mm-hmm. tree. One tool that we already have when we're building a new house, at least, uh, that I think a lot of people never even think about looking at is we have to get a soil test done for our engineer to, right. pl- to plan the foundation, right? And so they're going to be coming out on that property and taking, at, le- at least where we're at, two borings 15 or 20 feet down, and it's going to show you the soil types throughout that 20 feet, and it's going to show you where the water table is, the water table is close to the surface. So, I mean, I I, I think that would be a great tool to look at when you're trying to decide what kind of trees to plant. Yeah, is, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, get, give that soil report to an arborist and say, hey, what, what tree do you think would work well here? I've been accused of uh, using uh, soil soil um, reports uh, too much. Uh, but if you if you subscribe to the belief that 80% of tree problems happen below ground, soil matters. And, uh, you know, a fact that a lot of people don't know is that most trees in our area... 80% of those tree roots are going to be in the top 18 inches of the soil. Mm. So, you know, there's this, there's this misconception that a tree's root system is really deep. looks like the inverse of the crown, right? Because right? we've all seen pictures, you know, of, over, over our life of like this root system being really deep and broad. And actually, it looks more like a, like a wine glass on a dinner plate with the dinner plate being the, the root system. Mm-hmm. So soil tests are really important, but you really need the top you know, 12, 18 inches of the soil uh, to really get, you know, understanding of uh, what you're dealing with. And I would recommend, and I do recommend and use it frequently, uh, those types of soil tests, because it'll tell you a lot about the soil. And, and there's some there's some chemical properties of a soil that are really hard to change, like pH. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can, you can monkey with pH all you want and try to make it more acidic or alkaline, but it's really hard to take a really small piece of soil 
you know, in the context of, uh, you know, a city and change its pH permanently. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm a big advocate of soil testing. And that soil test will also, if you know that, uh, you know, the depth of like a, a sandy loam layer is a certain amount versus a, a, a stiff clay, that's going to tell you how that's going to drain as well. Or so, not drain. Or not drain, yeah. <laughs> Which is really our problem here. Right. Houston. Yeah, I mean, here in Houston, we have so much, uh, so much uh, highly expansive red clay and that the, the water doesn't drain through that clay like it does through sand. Yeah. So what are some other factors when we're talking about selecting a tree? I mean, there's there's also, um, there's the aesthetics, right? I mean, there's like, is, is the, the color palette on this canopy going to work with what we're doing, with what else we're doing here? Um, but also thinking about, you know, if, if, if the purpose is to shade an area of the yard, how wide is that canopy going to be, right? Right. And, and it's talking to somebody like yourself that kind of knows what these different species are going to look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years. Yeah. I, uh, in my, my bag, when I'm doing these projects, I carry a, you know, hundred foot tape measure, you know, the, the ones that wind up the spool the spool. Yeah. Uh, and I will, I'll show the client, I'll be like, Hey, okay, you want to, you're interested in planting a live oak here or, or whatever for your grandkids, you know, cause you, you know, you plant a tree for the next generation really. Mm -hmm. And I'll show them, okay, this tree at maturity typically is going to have a 60 foot, you know, uh, canopy span or something. And we'll, we'll put it out on the ground and give them a, a, the opportunity to kind of try to see it in there. And then I'll, I'll try to describe what the canopy is probably going to do. But, you know, the, the number one thing that, that people don't think about till after the fact uh, is maintenance. For example, there are some trees that shed all the time. Like take the pecan tree. Mm -hmm. Pecan tree is always dropping something, mm -hmm. right? It's dropping bark. It self prunes the limbs and stuff, and it's got the pecans and leaves, and and then it gets aphids, and so a lot a lot of pecan trees get aphids, and they drop that honeydew, which is really just excretions from the <laughs> the bugs. But it sounds better to call it honeydew, uh, and and they'll put the, you know they'll like they'll have it in their pool next next to pecan trees. And it's just a constant maintenance battle. Oaks kind of do the same. You know, they tend to produce acorns and shed stuff. Uh, there's a misnomer that that live oaks are evergreen. Uh, they're not evergreen. They do change out their leaves. Uh, they just do it in a kind of a different cycle. So mm -hmm. they kind of always looks like they have leaves. But you really got to think about, you know, pools and playground areas and where you park your car, you know, and this kind of stuff. Um, gutters. You know, if you're going to have trees anywhere near your house, you got to have gutter guards. It's all these little things that around tree maintenance that people don't realize after the, till after the fact. Yeah. And one big factor that we have here in the Gulf Coast area is you know, hurricanes, which you touched on a little bit, hurricanes and windstorms and things like that. And, uh, you know, some some trees handle that better than other trees, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm really glad you brought this topic up. Uh, we've seen, in fact, I was um, had a a consult in Houston a couple of weeks ago uh, in one of the neighborhoods that got really hammered by barrel. And you could drive down the street and one of the unique, if you know what you're looking for, the trees that had gotten sustained more damage uh, were the trees that had been over pruned, uh, not maintained enough, mm. or had never been touched and had a lot of just stuff in their canopy. And I'll, g I'll give you an example. You see it all over Houston on live oaks. There's something called lion's tailing, right? Where uh, they strip <laughs> all of the thing. Think of a, think of a long sort of meandering branch from a live oak. We've all seen them if you live around here. Uh, and you strip everything off that branch until you get to the very end of the, of the, of the limb. And uh, it's like a little tuft. Yeah. I, I, I'm laughing because my house is, is exactly like this. It's, well, it's, it, it, and well, don't feel backers. I mean, it's like, you. it's all for, I, I'm convinced that there was like probably some really rich guy, like, I don't know, like hundred years ago or 80 years ago, somewhere in town that did it. And everybody was like, Oh, we want to be like him. And, and then it just sort of permeated. It is the worst way to prune a tree. One of the reasons is that Trees have grown up, particularly live oaks, have grown up in the coastal areas here, knowing how to deal with high winds and high energy situations. One of the ways they do it um, is by having canopies that absorb energy and diffuse it, right? So if you ever watch an old live oak that's never been pruned before, when a hurricane hits it, 
it tends to move and ebb and flow uh, with the winds, and it dissipates that energy mm -hmm. pretty good. Because all those branches over the whole thing are absorbing them. Right. It's a system, mm -hmm. right? It's a system of energy absorption and transfer. And it works really, really well because that tree has been evolving for a really long time to be able to do that. So when you go up to a tree and you over prune it in lion's tail, like in this example, you create a system where physics is going to, you know, physics is going to happen, <laughs> yeah. right? And that, 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 that force of that wind is going to hit that tree and it can't dissipate the energy. And so you've got all this force on the end of a long branch that's, that's whipping around. Yep. And if you have even one minor defect anywhere in that, that, that engineering construct of that limb, it's going to put a lot more stress on that and snap off. So you drive around neighborhoods post hurricanes, the trees that were well-maintained, over their life, they don't fail at the same rate. It, well, let me say is they fail at a much lower rate than those that are taken care of. And so, uh, you know, strong, strong advocate for people taking care of the trees, um, especially in hurricane and, and or zones where you get a lot of ice and windstorms. Yeah. Uh, it's so that's a, your, your description of the trees. Like I said, my, I've got two water oaks in my front yard. In fact, you've, you've come to my house and looked at them for me. Uh, the, those two water oaks in the front yard, I've been there for 10 years, but you know, when I moved in, they basically you know, appeared like they do now, the big lion's tail branches. And sure enough, during the hurricane barrel that we just had, that exact thing happened. Uh, all that pressure was put out on the tips of those branches. And I had, I think, three limbs right over my house, snap off, bounce off my roof and right. and land on the driveway. Yeah, I'm sorry that happened, yeah. Tree, but you're not alone. And, and uh, so I... I think it's you know using science to understand and uh, how the world how well that world works with trees and then the arts just the application of it is you know, kind of what we're talking about here. Yeah. So let's, let's kind of keep talking about care and maintenance for a little bit. That was kind of my next topic here in my notes. Um, you know, like like everything else with your house, and I've, I've said this use this example many times, you know, your, your house doesn't have a check engine light and your tree doesn't have a check engine light either. Although trees, at least they're outside, you drive up, you walk up, you see them all the time and they'll give you signs if you right. know what to look for. Right. Well, I mean, I recommend holding onto the tree tight and whispering to it and mm -hmm. listening very closely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm kidding. That's what I do. doesn't really work. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, you know, if this is going to sound pretentious, but if you know what you're looking for, the trees will tell you something's wrong in the same way you can look at a house and be like, okay, <laughs> we got issues here, uh, which is sort of the, the case for having experts in, I mean, in anything that you need help with and know what they're looking at. But the average homeowner, it is amazing how intuitive people actually are. Like I give, I give my clients a lot of credit. A lot of the calls I get is like, Hey, something's not right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you're a parent, you've, you've, you've seen that too, right? Your kid, something's not right with your kid one day and you're like, I don't know what it is, but we probably need to go to the doctor. That intuition tends to hold true with homeowners, especially if they, if they care about their trees. And, uh, when you feel that, when you look at your tree and you're looking at your neighbor's tree and you're like, something's off here, mm -hmm. the color's off or like, that's usually a pretty good sign. You ought to listen to that. Uh, so that's, there's that. Uh, and then there's the more like acute things like, oh, we just had a windstorm and that looks like it might be a crack or gosh, the, uh, there's this big crack around the, uh, you know, the, the, the root area around this tree and it looks like it may have lifted up a little bit or something right in the yeah. last windstorm. <laughs> it's these little, little signs that, that, that you should pay attention to, um, a leaf that drop is starting to drop leaves too early mm -hmm. or the leaves are changing colors pretty good diagnostics, bark coming off a tree. Um, if you see really large mushrooms or fungal conch coming off a tree trunk or even, God forbid, the root system, that's another really good sign that, hey, we might want to, you know, now at that point, it may be too late. <laughs> if I can make one recommendation other than prune your trees correctly, somebody knows what they're doing, I would recommend getting a certified arborist that, you know, that's on a tree company staff to, to do that. The next thing you can do as a homeowner to really help your, your tree issues is monitor the moisture in the soil. 15 bucks on Amazon. You can buy one of these little moisture meters, right? And it says, you know, dry, moist, too wet on it. Mm -hmm. They're really great. Uh, 
Uh, get one with like a 12 inch probe on it so you can get down to that within the root system and just kind of walk around your yard. And your goal is to try to keep that moisture meter around your tree right in the middle hmm. at, you know, moisture, you know, but not in the wet zone and not o- overly dry. Because that in, in where we live here, that's probably the number one moisture management is probably the number one uh, issue that starts a tree st- stress cycle. I'm going to go in a little bit of soapbox here, but if you only had one clip from this entire uh, podcast, maybe to uh, put in front of a homeowner, it's it's understanding what the stress cycle looks like for trees. By the time I get a phone call that a post oak looks bad and it's got borers, you know, beetles in it, mm-hmm. it's way too late. The question you got to ask is, how did that tree get there? Very likely it started because... You know, past 10 years has been a really hard time to be a tree in these parts, and droughts and freezes and major, major rain events. But when a, tr- when a tree gets stressed, like let's say a drought happens, and maybe you're not watering your yard enough, or a drought happens and then you overwater, right? So a tree gets stressed on from the drought, then you overwater for a long period of time, and the roots get stressed, they can't get oxygen. Well, that starts a cycle where the tree starts declining a bit. The bugs... Bugs typically only attack trees that are stressed. Right. So then the bugs show up. It's and kind then, of like the lions hunt the weak exactly. animals first, right? It's, it's, it's <laughs> law of nature, man. And and before you know it, you've got this spiral, this downward spiral that started with a stress event that was a drought or overwatering or and and, it, and if you think back to high school algebra, remember the equation? It's like um, we use the example here, like tree stress equals factor A plus B plus C. In our current climate conditions that we're experiencing, and this is not a political statement, this is, I look at trees and nature a lot, and something's different Mm -hmm. in the past 10, 15 years, okay? Uh, In that environment where trees are already stressed, with the the climate pendulum swinging between freezes and droughts and all this stuff, sometimes it's just the addition of one more factor that causes that tree to decline or die. That could be your irrigation system was put in too close, you over-fertilized too much, right? And change the chemical composition of the soil, whatever it is, it can be that one thing. So try to prevent the problems, try to prevent that cycle from happening. And the best way to do it is monitor soil moisture. You know, it's really amazing that trees have made it this long uh, in the world without us, (laughs) without us doing all these things to take care. You know, it's all right. It's, it's amazing that they've evolved as far as they have without, you know, our help. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, I wanted to talk about you know, kind of the value of, of, of the maintenance and, well, sorry, the value of hiring a professional to do the maintenance. Um, and, and that's, and that's from a variety of ways. So that's the value of hiring a qualified consultant such as yourself, but also like a legitimate tree care company, uh, versus just the guy in the unmarked truck with a chainsaw on a trailer. Right. Um, it's, 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 it's just like choosing a contractor. It's like, do you want, do you want, do you want the guy who's got a legitimate business and a base of knowledge and the credentials, or do you want the chuck on the truck yeah. with, with some, with, with our, with the Ryobi tools, you know? Um, so what's the, uh, what's the value, the high level value in having a certified arborist that you're working with. Yeah. So uh, the caveat is I'm incredibly biased on this topic, right? Would we'll just acknowledge sure. that. Yeah, but, me too. But I think the way to think about it, though, is you got to think about tools in a tool bag, all right? You've got your tool bag, you got your hammer, screwdrivers, pliers, whatever in it. Every job requires a tool, right? You got to use the right tool for the right job. You're not going to use a hammer to try to, you know, screw a, we shouldn't use a hammer to try to put a screw in, right? <laughs> I'm sure, you know, people have. Um, so I like to look at it from that perspective is that, um, you know, somebody like me is complete overkill. If you've got a dead tree in the middle of your pasture out in the country and you're like, Oh, we need to take the tree down. Right. Right. You don't need me to come out and be like, yeah, dead tree, take it out. Right. <laughs> right? So don't pay me the hourly rate. Right. Um, you can use Chuck in a truck for that. There's mm-hmm. no targets. Nobody's getting hurt. Right. But if you're conversely, you've got a major development project happening in an area with restrictions. You've got, it's an architect driven project. There's contractors call around everywhere. The tree's important to the design. Right? Now you're starting to get in a world where you need some varsity 
you know, knowledge and experience. So somewhere in that continuum, uh, there's a place for everybody. Yeah, uh, for example, you know, you use the uh, like it's pretty low barrier to entry to call yourself a tree trimming service. You mentioned the pickup truck and a chainsaw, right? Uh, yeah, that's that's true. There's a time and place for that guy. Mm -hmm. Your average homeowner, if I can make um, you know a recommendation, is if you're choosing a tree care company that's going to do the, your regular maintenance and pruning work around your house, pick a company that's you know probably been in the community for a while. Uh, and if, and they have a certified arborist on staff or, or as an owner, mm -hmm. a certified arborist is, uh, the certification body is the international society of arboriculture. And it is recognized around the world as really the only body that certifies, uh, arborist. And it's a, it's a pretty high barrier to entry to get that certification, the certified arborist. There's a, a, a body of work you have to study. You got to take a test. It's pretty hard. You're not going to pass it if you don't study. I don't care how long you've been in the industry. Like it's just, it's hard. And and there's things in that that's all that that cover like safety and professionalism, not just biology and tree care and pruning mm -hmm. and all this stuff. Uh, so my recommendation would be your your local tree care company uh, find one that has a certified arborist on staff or is going to be your point of contact or is an owner because the odds are their level of professionalism is probably going to be a little higher than the Chuck in a truck you referenced, and there and there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of certified arborists out there, so they're not hard to find. The next step would be if you need to do, you need consulting, you need um, you need kind of an independent professional thought that can connect a lot of dots together. That's probably the role of, of the board certified master arborist, right? The BCMA. There's not a lot of us out there, relatively speaking. You'll find them at some of the tree companies. You'll find them at some of the more at the national level tree companies, you know, the, the big shops. And you, and, but most of your consultants are going to be CMAs. And like I said, there's a time and a place to use them. Uh, there are there's a there is a designation called the um, uh, like a registered consulting arborist, and and that's a that's a niche uh, certification that's used for like a lot of expert wit. Um, you know, if somebody's suing somebody over what you did to my tree, and these appraisals are needed, and the lawyers need to you know have real formal paperwork to put together, that's really a really great application of what they do. But your average homeowner, average builder probably needs. Kind of BCMA for um, you know the the connecting and and the experience of of bringing people together on a project and know the holistic way to look at a tree. But if you can find a tree care company that's got certified arborist and is insured, insurance, insurance is a big one. Be huge with trees. Yeah, if you got those two things, man, I think you're you're setting yourself up well for success. Yeah, and. Just a word about that. I mean, when, when you hire the, the the truck on the truck again, there's there is a time and a place for them. Just like there's a, a time and a place for kind of the handyman truck in a truck too. Like you know, like you're you're not going to call me to come change batteries and your smoke detectors and all that kind of stuff. There's right. some great other companies that do that. There's handyman services. That's fine. But when you're taking on something like removing a tree around a property, um, there's a lot of liability that goes into that. Again, if it's yeah. in the middle, in middle of a pasture, who cares, you know? Um, although I mean, it, it, it could be argued there's some liability there too, right? The there's guy, liability. The guy and, drops the tree on right. himself and kills himself and his wife sues you and whatever. But Liability, safety, and those things matter in all circumstances. Yeah. But I would... My, my, that comment was more direct around the sort of like the technical nature of the sure. the, the job. Yeah, but, but just like um, you know, w with with construction, like make sure that the the company that you're hiring has the right kind of insurance that's, that's going to protect you should something goes bad. That tree falls in the neighbor's house, God forbid. Or uh, we we actually had an instance on a, a project where uh, a tree fell and and um, and did some damage to some city property. Yeah, uh, I think it was a light pole or something like that. And the first time I, I'd ever gotten this, I got a bill from the city. <laughs> so there's a there's a famous story or infamous story out there of a, a tree care company that was doing work in a residential neighborhood. It was around some power lines, and there's some there's some rules and and laws around who can do work around power lines, mm -hmm. depending on their, how much voltage there is in them. There's distances and all this. I mean, OSHA cares, um, uh, ISA cares, city cares for sure. Uh, anyway, this company uh, was doing some work. They made a few mistakes. 
uh, tree or a big branch or something drops on the power lines, like takes down the power pole, you know, blows up the transformer or two. Unfortunately, one of the crew died because mm -hmm. it came in contact with a charged, you know, the charged lines. Uh, and the city, the municipality, I think, as the story goes, like came after the homeowner as a, it was involved in the lawsuit um, and the legal wranglings of who's at fault. And there's a lot of finger pointing at, you know, the tree company, the individuals on the tree company, the homeowner, big mess. So you almost, have, unfortunately, in today's environment, you almost have to, you know, hope for the best, expect the worst. Make sure your own insurance is updated. You know, if you own trees in your yard, you ought to have, make sure your homeowner insurance policy, understand what it covers, what it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Wind damage, you know, your wind policy is different than your homeowner's policy. What does that cover if you've got yeah. big trees in your yard or near your house? And you certainly want to make sure people working on those trees are professionals and have coverage. Yeah. So you mentioned your uh, the expert witness stuff, which uh, which you do, and, and and you mentioned one of the certifications that kind of uh, deals a lot with the expert witness stuff. What types of uh, cases come up uh, in in court that require an arborist to to be an expert witness? Yeah. What, what types of things have you, have you dealt with, or well, pretty common? I try to avoid uh, expert witness courtroom work as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I've done I've done some work there. It's a real special person that likes to be deposed all the time, you know. Or you know, like, um, but the types of cases that come up, and there is a there is a whole lot of believe it or not of case law around the United States that has set precedents, um, both the state and every state's got it, but state, local, and even the federal level around tree law, probably for homeowners and, and for contractors, uh, the number one thing you're going to find is damage done to or by a tree that, that was, you know, uh, involved different property lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, the classic one is tree that shares a property line on a fence line or two and uh, one uh, homeowner really likes it the other one doesn't and the one that doesn't goes in and shaves straight up the tree on their property line because you know what i think i'm not an attorney but i think texas law has your property line going up like into space right yeah um and and so you can kind of do what you want with it there now there's some interesting case law out there that says okay well but if you did that and you end up causing irreparable damage to your neighbor's property, you might be responsible for replacing the part of the tree that you killed off. Mm -hmm. So now you're faced with a lawsuit, right, where you say, okay, I killed off that part of the tree. That means 60% of the tree was left. Now that person might be liable for 60% of a tree. What's the value of that tree? So a lot of the work I've done on, on that stuff has been appraisals mm -hmm. around what was the value of the tree. Another example, as I've done a few times, is uh, pipeline uh, spills or pipeline construction, where they come through with a right away, and they're going to be taking a tree out, and the pipeline company or the contractor offers the homeowner, hey, here's five grand for your 200-year-old, you know, live oak that's been in your yard forever, and they're like, no, it's not right. So it's sort of like justice is not served with a five grand check for that, <laughs> right? And then you know. Somebody like me will come in and, and do an appraisal and be like, okay, that tree's probably worth $100,000. And it's a formal report, you know, with the, you know, done by a professional uh, that's not affiliated with a family or anything. And then a lot of times the, that'll start a negotiation, right? And, and I, I have a hundred percent hit rate on clients in that situation and end up with a lot more money in their pocket <laughs> just because, you know, the guy on the other side of the phone, he's just trying to do the, get the best deal he can for his company. Yeah. And uh, so there's another kind of set of court cases I think you're going to, that you see, and that is the, um, damage caused by trees. When somebody did something like put down uh, weed and feed, too much weed and feed on one side of a lawn and the roots of that tree were up in that neighbor's lawn, roots absorb it, tree declines, falls on a house in a, the next hurricane. Who's at fault? It's for the judge to decide or a jury to decide, but what happens very typically is you get competing arborist points of view. You, they'll find two different uh, consulting arborists to write two different reports, and then they'll have to testify, not really against each other, but prevent their evidence in a court. Yeah. That happens frequently. But, you know, your, your vast majority of them are going to be damage caused by somebody else and the implications of that. 
you can always find somebody to back up whichever angle you want to generally speaking you want to yeah. take on it the valuation thing is fascinating to me like how, how do you how do you decide what that 200 year old tree is worth yeah man there's a text there's textbooks you know that thick out there uh, on on that and it is an entire field of study uh, there are without nerding out too much here there's there's depending on the circumstance there are different valuation techniques that you would use uh, depending on the circumstances the, the the most common one for the um, the most common one that you would use when you're trying to find, figure out the replacement value of a tree or what that tree was worth is you measure the tree and come up with the size of the tree in, in, um, from a couple of different variables. And then you find that same tree in a nursery and extrapolate the value. So if a one inch caliper or three inch is probably the, what you should be using for that example. If a three inch caliper live oak at your local nursery uh, cost you 200 and you just lost a 30 inch tree, you theoretically can extrapolate the value of that three inch to the, to the 30 inch tree uh, and come up with a factor. And then you discount it based on the condition of the tree. Mm -hmm. So is the tree... Mm -hmm. in, Depreciate the tree. <laughs> depre yeah. There's a whole set of depreciation value factors that go into that. The condition of the tree, the environment, the circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. All this sort of thing. You depreciate, get depreciated value. Uh, it's a very, very well-known and... A very respected approach to doing that, and mm. and that that's the most common common aspect is derive value from something that's easy to find, extrapolate it, depreciate it. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought. I I, I never thought about um, the the negotiation for the value of a tree on a on example like a pipeline right away. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, but it's always sad. You know, when you get there and the homeowner's just, and most of the time, yeah, they're angry, right? But they're just looking to get treated right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and, and, and also like, think, thinking about the value of trees when you're, uh, sell, when you're selling a property, right? If you, if you've got a property that's just a, let's say it's a lot here in town and it's a 10,000 square foot lot, a lot that's completely bare and empty, um, you know, put it next to another 10,000 square foot, kind of an equal lot that has a couple of really nice live oaks on it that are positioned in such a way where you can keep them and protect them and build around them successfully. Um, man, the people are going to pick the lot with the trees every time that lot's going to sell for a premium every time. Most definitely. You know, I, I've, uh, I've been out shopping for lots with clients before and there's certain streets that we go down. And as soon as you go down the street and you see the live oaks hanging out over the street, you know, as you mentioned earlier, uh, kind of at the very, very beginning, it's like this feeling when you pull down the street and you see this canopy, it just makes you feel like you're in a, a neighborhood that you want to be on a street that you want to live on. Right. It's like instant, instant memories, right? It versus, is. you know, and, and I, I think about this all the time when I go out to the suburbs, like when I go to, you know, Katy or Cyprus or whatever, and you go into a brand new subdivision and there's no trees or there's nothing but, you know, one to three inch caliper trees. Usually with too much mulch on them. Yeah. And, and, and you're driving through the neighborhood, you're like, oh my God, this place is bleak. Like I could never live here. Right. But then you go to, you know, five minutes away you go to a neighborhood that was maybe built in the late 90s, early 2000s. So now that, that, that neighborhood's 25 years old and those trees are really nice. And you're like, man, this is a great neighborhood. Well, there's no difference. I mean, all the houses are pretty much the same. The lots are the same size. It's the same distance from downtown Houston, but one's got more mature landscaping, more mature trees and boom, it's more, it's, it's more desirable. Yep. And that's the reason why you asked their question earlier on, you know, around people, why don't they think about the trees early on? They do. They're there building that new home or doing the remodel because they, they love the neighborhood. And you're right, like remove, move tree cover from a neighborhood and it does look pretty stark. But they, they think about it up front in sort of a holistic view, like, oh, this is a great neighborhood. I want to be here. And then they sort of forget about it until, you know, after the fact. Yeah. 
So that's a great place to kind of to kind of wrap things up. Um, I think we've kind of come come full circle there. Um, you know, so to kind of wrap things up, we always kind of go back to the team concept of working on a on a construction project and having a, a qualified arborist tree professional. That those are just members of our of our project team, right? Um, and so, you know, w- we need to get you engaged early on in the process. Uh, you know, don't, don't wait until something's wrong or there's a problem. You know, we need to kind of treat you as, as a member of the, of the team early to talk about, you know, getting a plan together. Um, what other, you know, takeaways do you want people to have here about this conversation about successfully integrating an arborist tree care professional into your project? Yeah. Um, bring them in early, uh, pay them a lot of money, make sure they're, <laughs> that would help, uh, Make sure you got a real professional on your hands and, and ask about conflicts of interest. It's okay to interview the arborist. It's okay to interview your builder. It's yeah. okay to, you know, interview your architect, right? Get, make sure that, and, and this is going to sound a little, maybe a little hokey, but make sure they're your people. They're on the same wavelength. You know, there are a lot of consulting arborists out there, um, or there are a lot of certified arborists at least. And you, you want to find one that feels like, they get what you're saying and they're really invested in your project and they're, they, and they're, yeah, like I said, on the same wavelength. So I would get them in early, make sure they're, they're going to fit in with the rest of the team. Also allow them to interact with the team level builder, architect, and, uh, find some, when you're interviewing those people, one of the best questions you can ask is don't, don't, don't ask them for their resume. Say, Hey man, give me two examples of a really terrible, home building, you know, construction development situation that you were exposed to and what happened, right? Listen to their war story. Yeah. And if they're talking about things like communication went bad, uh, planning process was done haphazardly or poorly, like that's, those are the hallmarks of a professional that have, has done this before. That's great advice for everybody on the team. Everybody on when the you're, team. When, when you're inter- interviewing them as a, as a potential team member. Yeah. And, it, and it's a really good sign and sort of a, I'm tipping my hat to you and, and people like you. Builders that are and, and construction advisory firms that are going to bring up the arborist idea early, probably a pretty good sign as a homeowner that you're working with a professional crew. If they're even thinking like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, good good people surround themselves with good people, right? And so good good builders, good architects are going to have that quality network. So, uh, yeah, again, if people are thinking about bringing Arborist on board, they're probably already thinking through all the other team members that need to be in place. Right. So well, what what other resources, you know, you, you mentioned a website where, where people can do some, some research, but what other we, uh, resources are out there that you could recommend people take a look at online or sure. books or whatever? And the number one online resource that I'd recommend for your average homeowner is a website run by the International Society of Arboriculture called treesaregood.org, <laughs> right? It's, I mean, it's a little bit of a hokey name, but it's, it's yeah. actually a great website. They've got a lot of easily accessible information on there. You don't have to have a PhD to, to understand it. Um, but treesaregood.org uh, gives you a lot of information, categorized very easily to get to if you're a homeowner or a tree owner. It also has the capability for you to find an arborist. Mm. You can go in there, put in your zip code. You can put in you know your uh, a bunch of criteria and find people that are qualified in your area uh, along with their contact information. So it sort of like pre-certifies for you and takes the hassle out of, uh, out of doing that. But that's a really good example. And, it, you know, the extension agency uh, for most states have a lot of really good science-based information. Uh, the Texas A&M Forest Service has got uh, a, lot of, a lot of information there. But so does Pennsylvania and Oklahoma and Alabama. Yeah. Um, and I would... I would start with places like treesaregood.org and your extension service for a good science-based information. Like anything else on the internet, Reddit's in, Reddit is interesting, but Reddit is not always right when it comes to tree care. Um, I'm a member of a, uh, of a group on Facebook uh, that shall remain unnamed, but uh, people go there and like post their tree problems on there. And uh, I, I'm, more, I'm more of a member because occasionally I look at it as a, as a comedy 
because the recommendations that are given to these people on yeah. Facebook from their neighbors and other citizens is terrible. I'm on, a, <laughs> I'm on a builder's group that's the same way. In fact, I've told Danielle before, I, I, I need to like screenshot some stuff and you know, like black out the names or whatever, but screenshot the conversation and then just do podcast episodes about this conversation that's taking right. place on these, on these like construction homeowner Facebook groups. It's right. hilarious. Yeah, I thought hilarious. Like it's, I watched the stucco podcast that you had here recently and, and I was, it's sort of kind of like that, right? It's like, Hey, I'm, I'm building a home in the, you know, lower swamps of uh, Southeast Houston. What's, what's the best siding I could use? And some, you know, there's always some guy that's like, Oh, he'll check out stucco, you know? Yeah. yeah I, I love I love cedar cedar shingle siding in in, right. in in that area, you know. But right. Anyway, but the yeah. So trees treesaregood.org and the extension agency websites of almost any state are going to give you some good practical science based, easy to access and use information. Yeah, and I'm sure that your alma mater, uh, Texas A and M, has got some great information out there. They're one of the lead, one of the leading they are um, yeah. agricultural schools out there, and uh, and uh, you, you have a, a forestry degree for that, right? Yep. That's right. Yep. So you got to got to plug your your alma mater a little Go bit. Ideas. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Uh, oh, last thing. Uh, tell us uh, if, if if people want to get in touch with you, uh, give your uh, you know website contact information. Where you, you know whatever you want to throw out there. Yep. Uh, Palomatree.com. P A L O M A tree.com. Uh, Paloma is Spanish for dove, um, and you know, I like that name a lot. So that's how it came about. And not, not a huge story there, but palomatree.com. You can send us a note. We'll get back to you real quickly. And uh, I wish everybody the best of luck out there. They're real valuable resources. And, you know, uh, if you can get ahead of the of the, the decline curve and the stress curve, keep your trees, the right amount of moisture in the ground will do a do a lot for homeowners and just remember right tree, right place. Right. Well, thank you so much for, for being here today. It's been a great conversation. I've learned a ton. Um, you know, I, 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 I tell Danielle and others all the time. It's like, I learned so much just from hosting these podcasts and having these conversations. I, I feel like, uh, I got some great information today. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And thank all of you out there for listening and watching and, uh, be sure and join us next time on the Your Project Shepherd podcast. Thanks a lot.